one of the great economists of the 19th century uh, was uh, Alfred Marshall. And he has as a, a sort of motto for one of his books, the seen and the unseen. And it's a marvelous motto for this. The most, what happens in economics over and over again is that there are two sets of effects of any action. The immediately visible effects and the widespread invisible effects. And the widespread invisible effects are often much more important than the visible ones. But people don't see them. Let me give you very simple examples. We have a quota on the amount of sugar that can be imported from various countries. The, the visible effect of that is that there are about a couple hundred thousand growers of beet sugar who uh, benefit greatly from it, who are able to keep on growing beet sugar. They don't benefit so greatly because most of the money goes into paying the expenses of growing the beets. And indeed, if there were no such quota, they would find something else to do. But who believe in, in the short run? appear, the visible effect is that they are able to have a market they would otherwise not have. The invisible effect is that every consumer in the United States pays twice as much for the sugar he or she buys as the world price. Now, you're a consumer. How much attention to the fact do you pay to the fact that you pay twice as much for sugar as you ought to? Is the fact that you pay twice as much for sugar as you ought to going to lead you to go down to Washington to testify against the sugar quota? But are the beet sugar farmers going to go down to Washington to testify in favor of the sugar quota? It's a typical example of the seen versus the unseen. The concentrated visible versus the dispersed invisible. And the major reason why roughly half the income of this country is controlled by governmental agencies instead of by the people who earn it is because of this contrast between the visible and the invisible. We talk about this, or we, about a majority government. It is a majority government, but it's a very funny kind of a majority. It's a majority made up of a whole bunch of minorities. You've got one-tenth of one percent of the people who are beet sugar growers. They're part of this majority. You got another two tenths of a percent, uh, two, maybe one or two percent, of the people who are in the textile industry, and they make us pay twice the world price for shirts and for other things because of textile tariffs and uh, textile agreement around the world, and so down the line. You got all these special interests. You got labor unions. You got these and those. Each one separately is a little minority, but they all get together. Each minority is more interested in its own little problem than in what happens for the rest of the country. And so it's willing to give its vote to the other things. If they'll give it, it's a, it's a case of log rolling. So what we have is a log rolling majority in which the majority of the people are not, in fact, represented. Is there any doubt in your mind? Suppose you were able to get an effective poll from the people at large on this question. The government imposes quotas on the import of sugar. The result of that is that X thousand farmers are able to grow beet sugar who otherwise would not, and that you are paying twice the world price for sugar. Are you in favor of this? Is there any doubt to you in your mind that a majority would say they're opposed to it? 